American Reformer, a new publication aimed at equipping evangelical Christians to confidently and forthrightly defend scriptural truth and natural law in the face of widespread cultural capitulation, addressing topics and perspectives ignored or dismissed by the mainstream and often increasingly progressive evangelical publications. Sounds good. It's not good. We'll get into why and why this matters, but let me start by reminding you what is at stake for Christians when we opine or publish ideas about what the government should do. And when we speak as Christians, what is at stake is our Christian faithfulness. We must get the Bible right. We must not abuse the Bible. So let's start where everybody starts on these political discussions. Romans 13, 3 through 4. For rulers are not a terror to good conduct, but to bad. Would you have no fear of the one who is in authority? Then do what is good, and you will receive his approval. For he is God's servant for your good. But if you do wrong, be afraid, for he does not bear the sword in vain, for he is the servant of God and avenger who carries out God's wrath on the wrongdoer. Hopefully we can use that to get our thoughts on the right footing as we now begin to compare what scripture says to what American Reformer says. So what is this American Reformer? It is a publication and a group, I'd say an organization, that is an effort by Nathaniel Fisher to create a new network for traditionalist American conservatives. It officially launched just recently, August 17th, 2021, when Nathaniel posted on Twitter, today marks our official launch. American Reformer, a Protestant journal confronting the central cultural challenges of our day, including articles from Aaron Wren, Brad Littlejohn, C.R. Wiley, Colin Redimer, and more. If you're active on Twitter, then these names uh, may be familiar to you. Our video today is going to cover what American Reformer is, who's leading it, and why we actually hope the project does not succeed. We consider these writers to be strongly opposed to classical liberalism and to the principles that founded the United States of America. They are opposed to the principle of inalienable individual rights. They represent a Protestant Christian attempt at entering the rising movement called national conservatism. So some of the prominent features of this national conservative movement include the movement is socially traditional and it seeks to put in laws at all levels, local, state, and even federal, to preserve the good of the traditional family, the good as they define it, including the economic and moral good. Notice the unlimited nature of that concept for its role. And then another thing about this movement, many in the movement are strongly opposed to immigration. That's one of the key defining traits. If you're not at least somewhat opposed to immigration, then nobody would ever mistake you for a national conservative. But I'm not saying that opposition to immigration that's illegal is wrong. I'm just saying that this is a key feature of this movement is strong opposition to immigration, perhaps immigration as such, perhaps even calling for a complete halt of any entry of new people into the country. And then another key issue is that this movement does not consider individual property rights in a free market to be a priority at all. In fact, that's basically what they're going to put on, on the altar and sacrifice. They're going to say, in order for us to sustain this movement and give this movement life, the main thing is we need to turn away from loving individual rights. That We need to turn away from our focus on the Constitution and on this negative vision of government and rights. We'll just kill that child on the altar. And in exchange, we're going to have a new revitalized conservative movement. Well, you sure are, because you're going to have every Democrat that's not a radical leftist on your side now. But anyway, let me explain. It's They favor government controls of the economy, possibly tariffs. They favor regulating every industry from the internet, which we see calls for day and night, regulating the trucking industry in the interest of the public good, expanded use of eminent domain. One of the, their key authors is named Aaron Wren, and he was rhapsodizing on the idea of the government using eminent domain in order to build new housing projects. I saw that on Twitter the other day. I'll make sure to link to that. So in other words, welcome to family-friendly socialism or light fascism. I'm not going to say it's the level of fascism that we see in Mussolini or other famous names, but on principle, the difference between them is simply a difference of degree, a difference of what they consider to be in the common good and what they consider to be pragmatic. So let's talk about some well-known names from the movement. Some of these names you'll recognize, Christopher DeMuth, David Brog, Johnny Bertka, Yoram Hazoni, R.R. R. Reno, Anna Wellis. 
Sorab Amari, Josh Hammer, Rod Dreher, J.D. Vance, Tucker Carlson. Some of these people are, are names that we've mentioned before in previous episodes and criticized. Josh Hawley, Marco Rubio, Daniel McCarthy, Richard Lowry, Christopher Rufo, John O'Sullivan. Some of these are associated with National Review, which we are highly critical of. Some of them are associated with First Things, a publication for Catholics that want to talk about politics. So anyway, I want to also mention, though, that prominent names within this movement actually already include the names that are listed in the American Reformer. There are already notable national conservatives, such as Ben Dunson, Nate Fisher, Brad Littlejohn, and Colin Redimer. They are all on the slate to speak at this year's National Conservatism Conference, which is on Halloween uh, 2021 in Orlando. So, you know, we'll link to that. And you want to see all the, all the national conservatives. Timon Klein is another one that comes to mind. But what they are is family-friendly socialists. That's how Jacob describes them. And, you know, we'll send you some links if you're not really sure that we're right about that. <laughs> you'll, you'll see it. All right, let me pause. Jacob, do you have anything you want to add before I move forward? Yeah, I, I think overall, and, and we'll definitely get into the details of this, but overall what you're going to see is that these guys, they, they basically, they agree with the left on all fundamentals. But they think that they disagree strongly with the left because they don't think in fundamentals. They only think in surface level concretes like aesthetics. And so, the, the, and they've got sharp disagreements with the left when it comes to aesthetics, right? When, when it comes to the way that culture should look, that they are strongly opposed to, you know, drag queen story hour, for instance, that they are strongly opposed to the, the urbanization of civilization. And so, so they, they've got a strong opposition to the left when it comes to something superficial like aesthetics. And, and that gives them the false sense of security of thinking that they're strongly opposed to the left everywhere. When in reality, they've got deep, deep, deep unanimity with the left when it comes to fundamental ideas, fundamental convictions, fundamental principles about the nature of man, about the nature of epistemology, about the nature of morality, and most explicitly in this video, uh, the nature of politics, the nature of the state, and, and the nature of our relationship to the state. They are going to agree with the left on collectivism, on the rejection of objective principles for the sake of pragmatic social common good, on the rejection of inalienable individual rights. They're going to agree with the left on all of that, but they're going to say, oh, but, but we hate drag queen story hour, so therefore we're remarkably different from the left. Well, no, and that, that's why we call them family-friendly socialists, as opposed to the drag queen socialists. And, and that's the alternative that you're going to be presented. You're gonna have the, the leftist progressives who are basically drag queen socialists, versus these quote-unquote national conservatives who are family-friendly socialists. The, the, the only major difference between them and the radical left is that they reject the aesthetic of the drag queens and mass immigration and all of that in favor of a more family-oriented localism type aesthetic. But really, that's the only fundamental difference. So if you're familiar with what we're doing at this podcast for the New Christian Intellectual, you're going to understand Obviously, we're going to be strongly opposed to national conservatism. This is the main competitor against everything that Ronald Reagan got right or somewhat right about property rights, about the uh, economic liberty, limited government. These are values we consider essential to the conservative movement and to the Republican Party. And if the national conservatives take over the Republican Party and take over the conservative movement, the things that we like about the, the party are going to be cut in half, right? There's, there's going to be some things that are good still, but half of half of them will be gone. So national conservatism is explicitly anti-libertarian and it is explicitly illiberal. And by illiberal, what we mean is they do not believe in uh, freedom of ideas necessarily. They do not believe in freedom of trade, uh, freedom of association, freedom of economy, all these different, these libertarian perspectives that have been found in the founding fathers. They're not committed explicitly to those things. Those are pragmatic matters. Doesn't mean yeah. they're one hundred percent opposed, but but those are not the basis of their political vision. The, the most important question to ask is: Do they affirm inalienable rights? Because they're going to play the Mott and Bailey game, where they're going to say, "Oh well, no, I I, I think we should have free markets." 
to an extent. I think we should have freedom of thought to an extent. I think we should do it, but not in principle, not to be defended as a principle because those things can be violated or curtailed or managed for the sake of the common good, whatever they define that to be, right? So the, the fundamental is, do they believe that rights are inalienable, are absolute? And the, the answer is going to be no. They agree, at the end of the day, they agree with Russell Moore that rights are never an absolute. At the end of the day, they are going to agree with Tim Keller that justice is about giving to those in need from those who have ability to fulfill the need. And we'll see that from Brad Littlejohn. I mean, he actually is, that's his position. We know that, and he's one of the writers here. So the, 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 the fundamental though is d don't let them play the Mott and Bailey game because th th they're gonna play all the same dirty tricks that the leftists do or that the woke people do when it comes to appearing as though they aren't actually as, as, as antagonistic towards the things that you value as they really are. Well, no, get to the root, ask the fundamental questions of, in principle, it, 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 is this an inalienable right? Do I have an inalienable right to my life, to my liberty, to my property? Or do I just have a sort of conventional right granted to me by the government so long as and contingent upon it serving the common good? Because that's really their position. Their position is, yes, you have rights, granted to you by the government and contingent upon those rights serving the common good, which means that the government can come and take those rights away and that it's right for the government to take those rights away whenever your rights aren't serving the common good, whatever the hell that means. This term common good conservative also comes up. And I think that there's a, a correlation. I'm not sure they're exactly the same identification, but common good conservative, national conservatism, there's a relationship between those ideas, wouldn't you say? Yeah, the relationship is just that the common good conservatism would just be broader because it's it's so vague, right? Common good conservatism is is really just a, a lazy way of saying, well, I what I want to conserve is something called the good for the most people. And, and you can just leave it at that. And these guys are going to come in and be more specific and say, these are the things that are the common good. These are the things that individuals must give up their rights for the sake of in certain contexts. So this movement, these people have not just all of a sudden said, you know what, this is a whole new vision. I would love to advocate this vision, but rather they've had this perspective all along. And it turns out that as the social atmosphere has shifted, those who already had these ideas have said, you know what, I can speak out about the fact that I had that conviction. I no longer have to pretend to be a Reagan fanboy in order to be accepted in the Republican Party. My day has come. Now it's marketable to be a national conservative of this type. So this is a marketing movement, and it is explicitly seeking to position itself as being the answer to the illiberal radical left. So then you're going to have the illiberal right versus the illiberal left. And I think that if you want to guess about what a national conservative's position is going to be on any political issue, just look at what the radical left says. And then ask yourself, is there a mirror image of that? So these are, I, I would call them anti-conservatives. They're a mirror image of whatever is on the left. So for example, ask yourself, should the government be paying to move foreigners to this country and to feed them? They're going to say no, but then they're going to say, and we should just not even allow immigration at all. A lot of them will say that. If you ask, should the government spend huge amounts of money to teach kids about critical race theory in the public schools? What's their answer? Well, what's the mirror image of that? No, no, the federal government should spend huge amounts of money in public schools teaching kids that critical race theory is a lie. You see, they're, they're making a mirror image, but they're not rejecting the premise that there should be public school. And a couple yeah. other examples. Uh, should the government be subsidizing your baby mama? No, the government should be subsidizing the married stay-at-home mama. Should we tax the rich? No, but we should punish the rich companies that are spreading these degenerate ideologies and, and so on. You said that this is a marketing phenomenon. One of the ways that they market, one of the ways that they're able to market is the same way that the woke are able to market through deceptive tactics, through sloppy definitions or anti-concepts. So here's a few examples. They, they will create a straw man out of individualism 
which you've got notes for little John on that. And I'll, I'll let you elaborate on that. So they'll create a straw man out of individualism to say individualism is escaping from all of society and basically becoming a hermit. And that's bad. Obviously that's bad. So we have to embrace the opposite, which is collectivism, right? So that, that's one dishonest ta tactic that they, they create a straw man and then get you to embrace their, their nefarious idea by objecting to the straw man and, and, and showing that are trying to say that those are the only two alternatives. Uh, another dishonest tactic is the whole nationalism versus globalism thing, right? So the, the, the left is globalistic in the sense of wanting a one world government or, or wanting supranational government. And, and we agree that that's bad. We, we agree that nations are good things, that, that nations should be sovereign. That's why we are, to a certain extent, allies with Michael Fallon's organization, Sovereign Nations. And we approve of that title because nations should be sovereign. They, they should be not beholden to the majority will of the rest of the globe. But that's not the same thing as global trade or global markets, for instance, of me being allowed to trade with somebody in a different country, which is what they want to conflate. They, they want to conflate those two things. They, they want to say, if you want to be allowed to trade with somebody across the globe, then you are no different than somebody who wants to be ruled by a government across the globe. So they, they want to conflate those two things, just like the woke do with all kinds of stupid ideas, right? So the, they use the very same dishonest tactics as the woke. The only problem is that too many conservatives, especially Christians, have not allowed themselves, that they've trained themselves to only be discerning when they dislike the conclusion of a certain argument. So as long as somebody's saying something that concludes with something that they like, they aren't discerning about the rationale for it, right? So a lot of conservative Christians are, are going to say, with the woke, for instance, the, the, the woke using the exact same tactic of straw men or sloppy reasoning or conflating certain things, right? The, the, the woke conclusion is, if you're white, you're a racist and a white supremacist. Oh, I don't like that. Now I'm going to turn on my discernment and I'm going to analyze the argument and realize, oh, there's something bad here. There's something stupid here going on, right? But the same person, the same conservative Christian will hear these national conservatives or these trad cons saying something that they like. For instance, the, the natural family is a good thing. And we agree with that conclusion, right? A and maybe even... Uh, that the government should subsidize the natural family. Well, I disagree with that, but the national conservative might like that. And so the national conservative isn't going to turn on their discernment in order to analyze the rationale for that conclusion because they just like it. And, and that's a problem that we're seeing here. And, and that's why these guys are gaining traction because people are selectively discerning. Most conservative Christians refuse to use their discernment unless they strongly dislike the conclusion being propagated. See what position this leaves those of us who actually do care about the vision of the American Founding Fathers. If our options are going to be national conservatism or radical leftism, then what place is there for Thomas Jefferson in this discussion? What place is there for James Madison in this discussion? These are the kinds of concerns that we have. We need to talk more about American reformer. We're going to highlight some of the things we found in their website and their opening set of articles. I think they had about six or so, uh, maybe a couple more, with, if you include their pages about the website and things like that. Note from the editor. Who is the leadership of this organization? It is Nate Fisher. He's a professional investor. Aaron Wren is an urban policy researcher and a writer for the New York Times and the Atlantic. Quite the qualification for a Christian publication. And then Ben C. Dunson is a New Testament professor who previously taught at Reformed Theological Seminary in Dallas and Reformation Bible College in Sanford, Florida. So other writers for the journal are going to include, as we mentioned, C.R. Wiley, Brad Littlejohn, Colin Redimer. Littlejohn and Redimer are the president and the vice president at the Davenant Institute, which is a similar organization to this one. It publishes a journal on Protestant political thought. So I was reading in the editor's note at American Reformer. It says, Roman Catholics have a long tradition of serious reflection on the positive role that the power of the state is meant to play for the common good of the world. Perhaps surprisingly for contemporary evangelicals, Protestants do too, although they certainly diverge from Roman Catholic teaching in many ways. So that's a frightening paragraph there, but I think I'll move forward. 
Um, they do say something good here. They say, we especially seek to help evangelical Christians confidently and forthrightly defend truth derived from scripture and natural law in the face of widespread cultural capitulation. And then also they quote John Calvin on general revelation, which is great to see somebody quoting John Calvin's positive endorsement of general revelation and natural law. Calvin talks about how in reading profane authors, the admirable light of truth is displayed. I've quoted that same passage before. So in the broadest sense, if you think about what is this organization, what is it trying to accomplish? It's providing a Protestant political theology that's not anti-natural law. Well, great. I'm glad to see it. And we are actually attempting to do the same kind of thing at For the New Christian Intellectual. We're aiming to speak to the same audience, Protestants who support natural law political theory. But we are actually providing an opposing message. Our message upholds individual rights as the principle. We uphold the vision of the founders of this country. American Reformer is speaking to the same audience, teaching the opposite conclusions. So in the articles that were published at their site, this is amazing. They seek to give us a vision for the political life of our country, and they have not quoted from Thomas Jefferson. They have not quoted from Madison or from any of the founders. They've not even mentioned the U.S. Constitution that I noticed, or at least not favorably. I didn't see a clear appreciation stated for liberty, individual rights, free enterprise, and these people are calling themselves conservatives. Do you see that this is a lie? This is a trick, a marketing ploy. Whatever it is that they are trying to conserve is not what the, the normal American conservative has ever tried to conserve. So let's look at the opening article. Uh, this is called Weasel Words and Molly Cuddles. Introducing American Reformer. It was written by Ben Dunsum. And I will give three main observations for, that will help us see what this article is going to show us about the overall organization. So the first observation is just what kind of conservatives are they wanting to be? I mean, I noticed in his article that he was quoting the Lord of the Rings, Richard Weaver, and Theodore Roosevelt. So that's the flavor of conservatives. Like you said, Jacob, an aesthetic conservative, right? I mean, Theodore Roosevelt, he seemed like a cool guy. Richard Weaver has an academic reputation. Uh, Lord of the Rings. Wow, heroism and values. We're values conservatives. That's those are the people. But you quoted those people, but you never quoted the founding fathers. That's heartbreaking. You never quoted any libertarian thinkers from the 20th century. It's, it's enormously that, that, revealing. That, that's because those people are their enemies. They are. As... I mentioned in a, in a private conversation with you, and as you alluded to just a second ago, uh, they are not trying to reform present day America back to the America founding, to the founding principles of America. They are trying to reform the founding principles of America back to some pre-enlightenment European collectivistic ideal. So my second observation, I think this is where it gets even more serious. My observation here is with this Bible scholar, seminary professors' treatment of scripture. They name as one of their distinctives the historic recognition among Protestants that political power can and should be used to promote what is good and to punish evil. So notice the phrasing, the carelessness, to promote what is good. That's quite open, right? And then he, they say, see Romans 13, 1 through 7. And then they actually explicitly say that's an idea that is sometimes at odds with classical political liberalism. Classical political liberalism, classical liberalism is, is the view that I would advocate, or it's, it's very close to the view that I'd advocate. So I'm, I was shocked when I saw them citing Romans 13, but then in inserting their own ambiguous wording, because they acted as if what they were doing was pulling the meaning out of the text. But here it says, political power can and should be used to promote what is good and punish evil. So notice what, you know, the, this is doing a lot of work here when they rephrase it to promote what is good. Promote. Is that in there? You can go check. It's not. Uh, actually, what it speaks about is praising the good man. Praising the good man, not promoting the good, like the collective good, the common good. That's not even part of the passage. But if you were a casual reader, you would come away from reading this and think that this Bible scholar, this professor at seminaries that are reformed, I mean, he was a professor at the seminary that was started by R.C. Sproul. So shame on him for treating this, this scripture in such a way that you would come away from reading him thinking that 
the Bible and that God himself through Paul spoke these words when he did not. It's the type of sloppy scholarship that we've come to expect from Keller tweets. It, it really is the exact same type of thing that you would expect Keller to tweet. So they explicitly contrast their concept of government with classical liberalism. In classical liberalism, the government praises the good, the good man, but takes a hands-off approach, does not set out on projects to make society better in ways that go beyond its roles as judge and sword bearer. Those are its roles. That's what it says in Romans 13. That's why I started this whole video by reading Romans 13 so that you wouldn't be confused. You started on the right foot and you realize this doesn't line up. So you compare their wording with the relevant verses Praising good people is what the Bible speaks of. But imagine if you changed it to, to promote the good. What could you accomplish? That is an unlimited phrase. Political power can and should be used to promote what is good. So I've already read Romans 13, 3 through 4. I'm not going to read it again right here. But you, you can get the same meaning from that passage or from 1 Peter 2, 14. Governors are sent by God to punish those who do wrong and to commend those who do right. Punish the wrong, that's an action. Commend those who do right. Uh, that's the same as what Romans 13 says. Praise the good. It's, it's a speech. It's, it's not an action. How could you miss that? It's infuriating. So um, they go on. Thus, this organization sets out from the beginning to promote a lie. And they, they make a convenient gloss, a word trick, to get from what the passage means to what they mean by using studied sloppiness. And R.C. Sproul would look at you, professor, and he would say, oh, that's studied ambiguity right there. He would. We can expect much of this kind of sloppiness from the American reformer. With the exception of articles written by Kevin DeYoung, I'm expecting scripture to be used poorly by every author. Incompetently, maybe scripture used in passing, scripture used dishonestly. Even just apart from like all the other evidences that I could bring into this, look, you can tell from Dunsum's treatment of Romans 13 that this organization is going to represent an anti-liberty version of conservatism. Political power will be used to promote what is good without any strict principles to limit that power. So, I mean, if that's their vision, then you can know that the principles of individual rights, property rights, free trade, they are not just cast aside by this group, they are hated, actively rejected. They consider that to be not a marketable vision for what they want to be promoting. It's the type of sloppiness and stated ambiguity that you have come to expect to see from Keller. And I think what we're going to continue to see as we go through these articles is that these guys actually have a lot more in common with Keller than they would probably be willing to admit because everyone today knows that Keller is such a terrible person, theologically speaking, in terms of cultural and political issues. But these guys would be hard pressed to differentiate themselves both in content and in style from the evil and sloppiness of Keller. It's the same foundations, the same principles, and it's just that they're flirting mm -hmm. with different demographics. Mm -hmm. So uh, there's another article from Aaron Wren. His first article is called Welcome to the Negative World, Why We Need the American Reformer. And uh, the negative world is a term that he coins. I will say Aaron Wren is a decent marketer. And what he does is coins new terms that make him sound like he's bringing this wisdom from some academic thing. But he's just coining terms left and right. And, and people gawk at it and they say, oh, that's profound. Oh, well said. That's a, you know. But anyway, so he, the negative world is a current American, the current American culture. It, it is, as of at least 2014, he says that the current American culture is overwhelmingly anti-Christian. That is, if you want to have any kind of prestigious social position, being a Christian is considered to be a social negative now. It's considered to be something that you would, wouldn't want. And he writes, this emergence of the negative world should have prompted the emergence of new strategies for the church. This need not have meant the end of existing strategies. After all, the culture war and the religious right style is still here, as is the secret sensitive model, as is the cultural engagement model. Yet the market is signaling that they are often not as effective as they once were. For example, Tim Keller has received significant critique in recent years, which is new for him, even though his message has remained the same. This is in part because the world has changed, where Christian strategies of engagement have not changed nearly to the same degree. So notice, He's making an odd move. He's evaluating engagement approaches by reference to whether they succeed in the market. The first analysis of a Christian approach should be, 
is this approach based on the truth? Does it faithfully represent the truth? And Rin seems mostly unfamiliar uh, with the problems of Keller's message. You know, he's, I don't know, he just kind of overlooks it. I don't think he completely agrees with Keller, but he, I don't think he knows how much he has in common. Well, th this is this is a trend with Wren. Uh, the the popular article that uh, Michael Foster shared of Wren's a little while ago, I think about owned space or something something along those lines, uh, had the same theme of it, it was all about power dynamics and marketability of ideas, and just completely ignored any relevance of the truth of the ideas being discussed. Uh, and then on on his relationship to Keller, I'll just note, he recently did a podcast interview of Jake Medor, who is a self-described sympathizer with socialism. Uh, the uh, editor, I think, at Mirror Orthodoxy and a devotee of Keller's, like, like a, a, a disciple of Keller's. And in the interview, Wren and Medor were both speaking very highly of Keller uh, it, particularly in regard to his theology of justice and society and things like that. I could go a little bit more into covering what Rin says in his article, but it's pretty service level because, I mean, he says things like, we need a vision that has been conceived entirely in this negative world, which he defined. And he says, its mission is to fill the gap in the Protestant world and develop new thinking and new strategies for today's realities, drawing on the best of the Protestant tradition in doing so. So, all right. <laughs> I think we, it'd be nice if you would give us some indication of what the new thinking and the new strategies are. It'd also be nice if these new thinking didn't sound exactly like everything that America was founded to reject. I don't think that it's new thinking. I think that they represent a vision of old world, pre-American, pre-individual rights concept of government. I think that the fact that he even thinks that his thinking is new thinking suggests a deep ignorance of history, including at least three centuries, the 20th, the 19th, and the 18th. Uh, next, I want to point out an article submitted by Serge Trifkovic, and he, I think it's, he's a Hungarian, perhaps, because this is a repost of an interview with a Hungarian prime minister and notable advocate of national conservatism. His name is Viktor Orban. The article is just a favorable interview with, with this Orban advocating illiberal democracy, which is the kind of government that he has installed in Hungary since he took over as prime minister 11 years ago. 11 years is a long time to be prime minister, but in this illiberal democracy, you're going to see that the, the definition of that term is interesting. It's where you have democratic processes in place, but it's not clear if they're actually functioning because the, the person who's the prime minister doesn't give any kind of transparency on, on how the government is operating, or where the funds are going, on whether the votes are being counted. It's maybe a democracy. That's the, the defining quality of this illiberal democracy. So I read the article with interest because I just recently read something from Andrew Sullivan claiming that Viktor Orban is a kleptocratic light fascist. And Sullivan is a mainstream political commentator. He has mixed quality. I disagree with him about a lot of things. He's not a Christian, although he claims to be Catholic. But Sullivan's assessment and his reporting was useful to me. He condemned what he would call Orban's illiberal, corrupt, authoritarian government. And Sullivan was claiming, you know, that the conservatism that he wants to celebrate stands for limited government a free press, free speech, free association, free markets, freedom of religion. And for these reasons, mm -hmm. if that's what conservatism is, then Orban is anti-conservative. But here we have in the opening articles of American Reformer, a favorable interview with Orban. Why? Well, because the man is a Protestant Christian. And in fact, he is the only reformed Protestant Christian that is a head of state in any nation in the world currently. So this anti-conservative vision of, of Orban is what we see. Sullivan reports something from the International Press Institute claiming that nearly 80% of the market for political and public affairs news were financed by sources decided by the ruling party in Hungary. Sullivan describes Orban's government as treating the free market as a joke, one man directing vast amounts of state funds to his friends and cronies in return for their support. Among notable usurpations we could point to, it seems that Orban has placed the country's universities in, under control of foundations run by the ruling party. And so this move is similar to what the national conservatives want to do in the U.S., the education system being used to ensure that future elections go as planned. So Sullivan claims in Hungary, economic freedom means that your job often depends on your loyalty to the regime, where the Orban-supported 
oligarchs police the workforce for dissent. Now, I don't know if Sullivan is painting with an overly broad brush here, but you can see the illiberalism uh, just when you read the quotes that they put right in the American Reformer. Orban says, we will never accept the separation of church and state as it is interpreted in the West. Yeah, they, they basically want the, the same type of totalitarianism and authoritarianism that the left is pushing for only with their own family-friendly values, right? That, because the, the left wants to be able to indoctrinate children, to control elections, to allow for fraudulent elections with the appearance of them not being fraudulent. The, the left wants to cajole you into obedience through certain economic sanctions and, and your, your employer not being allowed to employ you if you don't have the right views. All, like the left wants to do all of those same things that Orban is doing, only with a different ideology. So the, the, these guys want all of the same totalitarianism and authoritarianism as the left. They just want it with family-friendly ideology rather than drag queen ideology. That's the only difference. I think probably the reason why they selected this interview from Orban is because of what he says about immigration. Our fundamental position on the issue of immigration is that it is an ontologically bad thing, says Orban. It is bad if one cannot stay and live in his country, find his personal happiness and vocation there, and if he has to leave it, especially under duress. Occasionally, it happens that a person has to leave his homeland because his life is in danger or someone wants to enslave him or put him in jail or he would starve to death. These are possibly valid reasons. However, if someone were to leave their homeland, the goal should be to return later on. And I think that they appreciate and Tucker Carlson has favorably interviewed Orban. And it was it was weird how much he seemed to just want to prop this guy up. But it's like, really, like this is what you stand for, Tucker Carlson. This is what you want to celebrate. And yeah. just the things he'd overlook to, to praise such a man. Well, and, and that quote particularly stood out to me because I because I know that the the national conservatives and Tradcon people would love that mindset, and and I'm trying to think, what what in the world like wh why what wh what does that even mean? How, on what basis or rationale is immigration fundamentally ontologically bad? Like what what does your geographical location have to do with your ontology? or morality like think, what, what yeah, is the supposed connection it th th there is no connection it's just absurd and then to add on like like ju just on the face of it it's arbitrary and absurd but then in addition to that it's contrary to the bible right the uh, imagine if the sons of adam had that mindset don't go out and fill the earth with the knowledge of the glory of the lord because we have to stay here in our tribe, right? Don't go too far. Imagine if, if this Victor Orban could have a conversation with God about God's apparent mistake in telling Abram, move away from where your father is. We're going to send you to another land where there are already other people living there. Yeah. Like, like does, does Orban think, okay, well, I don't know if he thinks about that. Yeah, no, and, and here's the thing. They're going to try to do a straw man of us saying, oh, so you think it's good to leave your homeland right so it, it's like you have to either choose between it being good to stay in your homeland forever or it being good to just leave your homeland and and, and that's it, it's absurd <laughs> well have you thought for a second that there's a third alternative that your homeland or your geographical location is relatively insignificant morally speaking that you should have higher priorities like, what has God called me to do? And where can I best achieve that? And then you go there, whether that's your homeland or not. Like, what, what, why does geographical location have to matter one way or the other? Whether you're saying you should leave it, as some might do, I guess. But I, I don't know of anybody who would say that. Maybe some liberals who say you should, you should always leave your homeland because, uh, you know, it, it's good for you to get out. I don't know. Uh, and then these trad cons would say, you should never leave your homeland unless you absolutely have to. Like, wh why does it matter? That That's so morally insignificant. I, I don't understand. It, it's just stupid. Let's move forward to C.R. Wiley's first article. It was called Sisyphus <clears throat> Just Keeps Rolling Along. And this is a review of Scott Yenner's The Recovery of Family Life. And so the family-centered local first themes of national conservatism come out in this article. Wiley discusses the implications of postmodern philosophy on social life. 
And uh, the article is, I don't know, it's, it's a little bit vague what it's even talking about, but postmodernism attempts to deprive people of certain knowledge and universal standards. And so instead, as we mentioned earlier, and we agree on this point, st the standards are treated as if they're just a cynical power play. And so Wiley speaks about postmodern philosophy, but when he speaks about postmodern philosophy, he actually uses the term ideology. This is a common thing that you'll, you'll find from the national conservatives is that ideology is bad. And when we say ideology, when, when the national conservatives say ideology, they mean postmodern philosophy. Just keep that in mind, keep that in mind and you'll understand what he's saying here. Wiley writes, ideologies are predicated on the conviction that nature doesn't speak to us. Ideologies always overreach because they ignore the limits of what politics can accomplish. So his concern is that ideologies are not realistic because nature can only be pushed so far by your vision of what right and wrong are and what, what the political order should be. So he might tell somebody that has an ideology, well, it's never going to work in reality because nature is intractable. So what is his alternative to ideology? Um, it's we need to promote a realistic yet sufficiently flexible understanding of nature. What does this mean? Nobody knows. So apparently national conservatives are going to seek the common good by means of the state taking some responsibility for the progress of healthy families. Some responsibility, but not too much. So the vibe I get from this is the Marco Rubio vibe, or or perhaps even the Donald Trump or Ivanka Trump vibe. You know, the we should have a, a federal law that says that you have to pay for maternity leave, something like that. A little bit of help for families, but we don't want to get too invasive. That's, I mean, I think Marco Rubio and Albert Mueller would agree with this article. Just the idea of incentivizing healthy family structures. These men are not in the school of the Founding Fathers. They may as well have never heard of the Founding Fathers. Any comments before we move forward? Yeah, just the ideology thing. It, it's not that when they say ideology, they mean postmodernism. It's more of a word trick, right? Because when they say ideology, so. they say ideologies. They would include capitalism as an ideology to be avoided, and they would criticize it for the same reasons that, that it's too idealistic or whatever. Uh, so, but but when you ask them, you know, give me a specific about ideology that's bad, then they're going to just point to postmodernism. So that they want to conflate the two, and so in some ways, it's an anti-concept because it doesn't mean anything objective. So it's just it's another one of their word games, similar to the way that the woke play around with words in order to say what they what they want to say without really explicitly saying what they mean. It's a sabotage of language and words are sacred. But they don't they don't treat it like words are sacred. So this next article I spent the most time on because it's the longest. It's the most well-developed argument, in my opinion, although it's. Uh, logically has many flaws, but it's at least an argument. This is Brad Littlejohn's article, Why Christians Should Be Nationalists. And I want to talk about his bald attempt to misdefine individualism. Just like we've seen with other writers, they're plain word tricks here. And, and so I want to point out at the outset, there's a lot in this article is quite good. Uh, I agree with Littlejohn on many of the things that he just states and as things that he takes for granted. It's the the places where he begins to make a distinct claim, or it's the kind of way that he argues to his claim that I want to critique, because I think that this is dangerous. As Jacob mentioned earlier, a bad argument for a good conclusion is dangerous. Let's talk about what Little John says. If you, if you read his article, you can find this under the header, Individualism. Little John writes, one of the Bible's very first statements about human nature is a rejection of all forms of individualism. And then he quotes, it is not good for man to be alone. Genesis 2.18. And then he writes, from Genesis 2 onward, mankind was designed to live in community, first in the family, to be sure, but Genesis soon traces the growth of these families into clans, tribes, and nations. So Michael Kissel at the Ex-Cogitate podcast helpfully pointed out individualism has never meant solitary existence. And uh, I saw your comment, Jacob, individualism does not mean being alone. It means being able and willing to be alone in cases where evil and stupidity of the world makes it necessary. Comments before we move forward? Yeah, I, I think it's just really important to, to point out that, that, that because th this is a common slur against individualism from all sides, right? This isn't just from these national conservatives. This is the same way that 
uh, leftists would smear individualism also. And so it, it's helpful to understand that individualism doesn't mean retreating from reality and, and being against the community or even against the collective, nominally speaking. Uh, it, it means the ability to stand against others, whether it's the collective or the community or whatever, when necessary, right? If there's ever a conflict between you and the collective, how are you going to respond to that conflict? Are you going to submit or are you going to stand for what you believe is true and right and good? That's the fundamental question. If you are a collectivist, you are going to submit to the collective and sacrifice what you believe is true and right and good on the altar of the collective. If you are an, an individualist, you are not going to submit to the collective. You are going to stand with your convictions. That is the fundamental test to tell between individualism and collectivism. And apart from such conflicts, the individualist celebrates being in harmony with the rest of the community. The individualist wants to be in community with others so long as it's free of that type of conflict. But he's ready and willing to be opposed to the collective to the extent that there are fundamental conflicts between the values and their beliefs. So we're not asking our collectives good. That's no. not, it's, it, that, oh yes, they are. So I'm a collectivist. Yeah. It's how should individuals relate to one another within the context of a collective what has epistemic priority, the truth as perceived by the individual or the truth as perceived by the collective? Because the collective doesn't perceive the truth. There's not a collective mind. Exactly. It's, it's, the, it's the truth as perceived by the individual versus the truth as asserted by the collective. Good clarification. So our seventh episode and our eighth episode of the FTCI mm -hmm. podcast go into detail about that. I just want to point out that you can usually find out a lot about somebody by what they what they do with that term individualism if they try to use that term to refer to people who are self-obsessed and who are antisocial then you can tell that they're either very naive or that they are collectivists and that they are playing word games so little john's statement that the bible rejects all forms of individualism is amazingly strong and you'd think if you were going to make a statement like that, that you'd be real careful about how you define the term, but he just defines it in passing in a way that nobody, I can't think of a single person that thinks that's what the word means. Being alone, not living in community, that's what individualism is supposed to mean. I mean, there might be a few hermits in the world that advocate individualism as he defines it there, but that's, that's not a common view. Yeah, it, this is similar to the uh the boogeyman of white supremacy that the wokesters are always talking about right so th th they want to paint this picture that there's all these white supremacists out there and and we're standing up and fighting them he, he wants to paint this picture that there's all these rabid hermits out there who want to retreat from society and who want to break all social ties and he's standing strongly against them a and in both cases you kind of stand back and scratch your head and be like who the are you talking about dude <laughs> like, right and if you cannot identify the target of the attack ask yourself okay then what's the opposite idea here and he's just promoting the opposite of that mm -hmm. and that that's the trick i mean it's exactly like uh, like tim keller and so it's no surprise that little john actually is a promoter of that collectivistic view of justice and uh, we may cover that more but let me go on in his, and uh, you know, Jacob, you can stop me if, if this becomes too much material, but I had a fun time dissecting it as sort of a yeah, no, go afternoon ahead. activity. <laughs> uh, God doesn't merely tolerate the emergence of nations, but celebrates it and makes it part of his redemptive purpose. He calls Abram out of Ur with the promise, I will make you a great nation. I think it's funny that little John has referred to that text when the previous article by somebody else ignored that text. <laughs> but from here on, out God's dealings with his people are with them as a people, a singular form of this slippery English noun as a covenant community rather than as individuals. Throughout the Old Testament, they experience God's blessings and curses. They experience victory and defeat, righteousness and unrighteousness as a collective, a people, a nation. There's a lot in there that we could comment on. It's simply, he's painting with too broad of a brush. 
right? Because God did continue to deal with people as individuals and in significant ways. But let me go on. Uh, he writes, it is worth pausing to reflect on how jarring this is or should be from our modern libertarian perspective. Um, and you can see his meaning now in which each of us expects to be able to do what is right in our own eyes and to be judged purely on our own merits. With Cain, each of us is apt to exclaim, am I my brother's keeper? God's implicit answer to that question throughout his dealings with Israel is yes. So he goes on, we all instinctively find our identities in something larger than ourselves and experience its triumphs as our triumphs, its failures as our failures, its deeds as our own. Through most of history, these identities were largely an extension of family relationships, the clan, tribe, or nation, from the standpoint of politics, this human tendency is a very good thing. Without it, government would have to be much larger and more oppressive, as we have seen in the 20th century. That's an interesting argument. So here, Little John is indicating his support for the national conservative model in which there are two alternatives. You can either be a collectivist localist, or you can be an individualist totalitarian. Like, like totalitarianism and individualism, they will come together as a package. If you choose one, you'll get both. But if you choose collectivism and localism, you can have both. And, and notice, notice his premise in, in his argument for, for that, that alternative. The, the premise is that the only possible check against individual sinful desires is the collective either of your tribe or of the state. Yes. That's the only possible check. What, what is he leaving out? Repentance, reason, the Holy Spirit, revelation. He, he, he's, he's negating everything about individual man. He, he's negating everything about a individual man who could be convicted by the Holy Spirit through the revelation of God and individually turn from his sin to some degree or another, he's negating all of that and treating man as though the only thing that can influence man from bad to good is other people. It, it's, it's a complete decapitation of the Christian worldview, cutting God out of it completely and horizontalizing it. Every, instead of a vertical relationship between the individual and God, that's cut off. And your only access to morality is now through other people horizontally, whether through a local collective, your kin, or through a more global collective, the state. I want you to notice that he's making this argument within an article about why we need nations. He's arguing that the organization of the nation as such is uh, is going to, especially if it is collectivist and localist, that, that is going to uh, be the solution. So he goes on, if we see ourselves as part of something bigger than ourselves, if we are more apt to make sacrifices and to conform our behavior to the needs of the whole without needing to be told by an explicit law or government agency, if, however, we see ourselves as so many independent individuals seeking our own personal fulfillment, there will be nothing to resolve our inevitable conflicts except the law, nothing to keep us in line but the surveillance state. So this is false dichotomy he's asserting here. This is quite a passage. There are parts in here that I do agree with. God deals with people as nations, but also as individuals. Let's just take that point from Little John. You know, I mean, the point is trivially true that God does deal with Israel as a collective. Mm -hmm. But is it is it carrying the weight that he wants it to have? So notice that the recipient of his actual attack is the lowercase l libertarianism. And he, he associates that not with his actual definition, people should not be aggressing against each other, but with a biblical phrase from judges, everybody doing what is right in his own eyes. Now, I would call foul on that. It seems to be a question begging for his collectivist conclusion, but there's too many other fouls, so we should skip ahead. So Little John is arguing that an individualistic culture, individualistic on his control of the term, logically leads to the need for a surveillance state. And I'm, I'm not guessing because he so much as says that later in his article, I want to skip ahead to another section. He says, rather than finding their individual wills channeled into a common project, People are left to feel that there is no common project except perhaps the glory of the empire. Here he's criticizing imperialism. A glory too vast and remote to have much meaning for them. Imperialism, in fact, often goes hand in hand with individualism. Empires tend to dissolve all subsidiary institutions and communities that stand between the regime and the individual. The individual may now have more space for self-expression, but no opportunity for participation in self-government. 
So now I want to skip back to where we were in the argument before. Little John writes, the tribe is built on the most basic human bonds of all, the bonds of birth and family loyalty. The tribe is an extended kinship network and as such naturally channels the individual wills of its members into a collective will. A conviction of what happens to one, that what happens to one affects all and that each must sacrifice for the welfare and honor of the whole. So you can tell he's, he's endorsing that uh, this local localized collectivism spirit. And so I just want, want to say like, Sure. I mean, part of his thesis is true that if you lived in a very small tribe, your individualism would be subverted. I, I agree with his assessment there, and we, but I want you to think about why. Think about what life is like in a small tribe, uh, in the ones that have existed historically. They typically lived on the edge of poverty, right? The choice to live in a very small tribe, apart from the rest of civilization, is not just the choice to to live around few people. It's also going to be the choice to be poor by definition. And when you are in poverty, then you are living close to an emergency situation, whether or not you feel the weight of that every day. So just as everyone next to you in the foxhole is going to be your friend, you know, they, they say that like people just feel this, this sense of brotherhood when somebody's next to them in the foxhole, because you know that their life is in your hands and vice versa. Well, so everybody in your tribe has to be treated the same way. They're like your family, right? I mean, you cannot survive without that little tribe. But who's to say that that form of life is preferred or that that feeling toward somebody just for that reason that they happen to be there is preferred? I want to compare Little John's perspective with this. This is what Ayn Rand writes. The savage's whole existence is public, ruled by the laws of his tribe. But what's the opposite of that savage existence? Rand writes, civilization is the progress toward a society of privacy. This is what Little John does not want. Rand writes, the savage's whole existence is public, ruled by the laws of the tribe. Civilization is the process of setting man free from men. That's from the soul of an individualist for the new intellectual. I wonder if Little John has read this. He senses, rightly so, the fundamental incompatibility of Rand's view with his view. Uh, he, he knows what is the fundamental threat to his view. And so, he, and when he states that threat, uh, it gets really close to what Ram says. I, I think it's it's important to point out what the the shift that he does, and that many people do when they talk about uh, God treating Israel as a nation, you know, quote unquote, rather than as individuals. You pointed out that's not true. It's not rather than as individuals because he still deals with people as individuals throughout the Old Testament, while also dealing with Israel as a nation. But in addition to that caveat. There's the fact that the nation of Israel, the people of Israel, was meant to be a type of the church, not a type of modern day nation states or even modern day communities. So the, the, the analogy for today is God treating the church as a collective. And he absolutely does, in addition to treating individual Christians as individuals, just like he did with Israel in the Old Testament. Um, but you, you can't go from that to saying, therefore, uh, we ought to see every collective as similar to the way that God treated Israel in the Old Testament. No, you can say we ought to see the church in that way. And in a lot of ways, the church is that way. But what unites the church? The doctrine. Yeah. Individual belief, individual conviction, individual va- individuals agreeing doctrinally and convictionally about ideas, about doctrine, and about values, about moral values that unite them together. Those are the things that unite the church. And so the, there's nothing uh, incompatible with individualism there. In fact, it, individualism is necessary for it, and that, that's sort of a different conversation. But it, when, when you focus in on what is it, you know, what, let's, yes, let's affirm God treats Israel as a people occasionally throughout the Old Testament or, or even predominantly throughout the Old Testament. What does that mean? What, what, what are we supposed to take from that? Let's follow it through. What we're supposed to take from that is that he's going, that, that was a foreshadow of the church. He's going to treat the church that way. Why is he treating the church that way? Because the church is comprised of people who are united in Christ. How are they united in Christ? By faith in Christ. Faith involves conviction ideological and moral aspects of individuals agreeing 
with certain things. That's what we should be taking from the fact that God treats Israel as a people group uh, and the way that it relates to the church. And, and, and then you can see how it fits in with the individuals that we're talking about. It's really helpful. Let me read further in Little John's passage. He says, since tribes are small and decentralized, moreover, they are constantly vulnerable to destruction from determined powerful neighbors who succeed in temporarily upsetting the local balance of power. These weaknesses are on full display throughout the book of Judges, which depicts the nation of Israel stuck in a pre-national state. Although the 12 tribes have been forced to function as a coherent whole through the exodus and conquest by the leadership of Moses and Joshua, they have quickly reverted to an increasingly divided and impotent state, constantly vulnerable to foreign conquest and internal dissension, and unable to reliably administer justice. Whatever the ambivalences of Israel's clamor for a king in 1 Samuel 8, scripture seems clear that the political unification was necessary. So this is a startlingly weak, startlingly weak argument that he's making right here. The opposite of what he is saying here is true. So first, let's look at that, uh, the point about Israel calling for a king. When they called for a king, what does the passage teach us? What is the passage's perspective on those events? It tells us that the people were rejecting God as being their king. Under the judgeship of Samuel, the people had been making progress in at least some ways. For example, geopolitically, they'd been they, they had victorious battles under Samuel. Religiously, Samuel had a school of prophets. So there's no indication from the text that there was a new political organization necessitated by this situation that they were in or advocated by God. There's Now, we know that there was always going to be a king because God sees the future and that God had purposes for there being a king. But we see nothing from the text that specifically says that the state of Israel was better off under a monarchy versus under the judges. That transition was something that Samuel warned them about the negatives that would happen when, when it took place. He said, you've asked for it, but here's what you're going to get. The king is going to take away your sons and send them to war, take away your daughters, and they will serve him. So we have no indication from the text for the, the very core of what little John is trying to use for his argument here. And in fact, the exact opposite, the, the, they are chastised for reject, like you said, rejecting God as king because and, and this is the, the view of individualism that we are advocating. You, you will either be an individualist seeing God as king with no man in between you and God, or you will place a king above you to act between you and God, to, to stand in for God for you. And, and, and that, that was what the, the people of Israel were doing, that they were rejecting God as king. Because that, that was too ethereal or, or too you know, spiritual for them. It wasn't, it wasn't real and concrete enough for them that they wanted a concrete human being to be their king. In a lot of ways, I, I, I keep coming back to this. It seems like these guys are, are really buying into the, the horizontal materialism of the world, uh, the, the concrete boundness of the world. Power of, dynamics. Of, yeah, of power dynamics, uh, of it, it's all about horizontal social change and relationships it, with, with any sort of vertical uh, relationship between us and God cut off as irrelevant, as pie in the sky, as too ideological. It, it, they, they want to flatten it all into mere horizontal power dynamics. And, and you can go on. I'm sure we'll see more of that, but I, that, that's, that's becoming a theme that I'm noticing here. Yeah, Little John in this article, in that section, he is suggesting that the form of government that Israel had under the judges was a significant cause to explain the amount of wickedness and hardship that they were facing at that time. And I think this is a silly thesis because it's a thesis about cause and effect. But if you're going to make that kind of argument, then you need to show a concomitant variation. When one thing changes, the other needs to change. And not just more than not just once, but that's the opposite of what we observe in the Bible. So it, if Little John's ideas were true, then you would expect to see there was a distinct improvement for the spiritual and the geopolitical situation of Israel once the monarchy was established, when it was established, and as long as it was established. But I don't think that's the case. If you if you look at overall in the history of Israel, 
on average, whether the people were better off in any of those uh, characteristics during the monarchy versus in the judges. So Little John, if he wants to claim that things were bad under the judges due to the lack of a king, he could at least offer some explanation for why he thinks that. Like that's part of a causal thesis is you have to say, well, why? I mean, he's, he's begging the question here. He's, mm -hmm. you know, I, and I'm not against there being a national government. I actually believe in the US government. I, I'm not a monarchist, but the, the point here is, is this really the quality of argumentation we're going to get? You know, if he's not even going to account for the facts, how is he going to make an explanation of cause and effect? He talks about how the people were being invaded during the time of the judges, oppressed, like, for example, by the Philistines. Um, but we know the cause of that. There's a cycle. It was the people disobeyed God. God sent the Philistines, right? So, and we know what brought an end to that. At, at the end of every cycle, the people repented. And then once they loved God with their hearts and they turned to him with their whole hearts and they obeyed him, they would be liberated. God would send the liberator. We know all of the causes here. Yeah. All of the causes. But see, the, and this is what I'm talking about. The, those causes are spiritual. They're vertical. They have to do with our sin relationship to God or our righteousness relationship to God. And, and they want to cut that off. And they, they, they want to naturalize it and, and give causal explanations that have to do with the natural phenomena of how men dealt with each other socially. They seek to improve our well-being in the United States today by changing the social organization. And they do not realize that the social organization will never be better than the spiritual state of the people. We can advocate for true ideas as a means of causing spiritual reform, which is a precondition for causing national reform. These people want to do it by changing the laws. They don't realize where the laws come from. And by changing the demographics of the people who are under the laws. Indeed. So, so the story in scripture, the spiritual life depends on the obedience to God. The political fate follows from your spiritual state. This is so prominent under both systems. It happens under the judges. It happens under the kings. In other words, how many ways could you possibly falsify little John's thesis here? <laughs> uh, <laughs> it's just, you know, you're not succeeding in demonstrating your claim if you just take a moment and think about it. So Little John says, okay, by, by enlarging the boundaries of the polity, the nation banishes violence to the periphery. Wars must still be fought, but they cease to be, I think he's just making stuff up now. He says, wars must be fought, but they cease to be the stuff of daily life. And they are more likely to be fought by professional soldiers on the frontiers than to invade every hearth and homestead. So is there any argument that anybody in the history of the world has ever made that from the book of Judges and the books of Samuel and Kings and Chronicles, that there, this was actually the case, that the overall amount of crime diminished under the kings, or that the overall amount of exposure to the horrors of war and the costs of war and death was different between one time and the other? We don't know. And I, I, I will tell you, little John doesn't know. Or if he does, he's not telling us. Yeah, I mean, is he just saying that because there's more people, therefore, uh, smaller percentage of the overall people have to actually go out and fight so a larger percentage are able to stay home i, I don't understand the the moral rationale here or, or 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 the moral point he's trying to make well he believes that the people's lives were materially better off under a monarchy than under the judges that's his claim and i just don't know that that's the case there were times in the story of the judges when there were peace there were times when everybody did what they wanted to, but under the kings, the kings ended up being the most oppressive people of them all. And, and so you can see a lot of uh, evidence that would weaken his thesis here. Yeah, let me go on what he says. And since the nation is able to durably unite the strength of many tribes, it is less likely to be suddenly overwhelmed by powerful neighbors. Indeed, although Israel and Judah experienced plenty of foreign invasions during the books of Kings and Chronicles, it's worth noting that most of these just gradually chipped away at their boundaries rather than reducing the people to complete servitude as in the era of Judges. Well, there, there were some times in the book of Judges that some of the people were in servitude or even complete servitude or inability to, uh, to use a blacksmith and make weapons or to, to keep their grain, as you know from Gideon. But Little John is skewing the facts to fit his thesis here. He doesn't mention the fact that Judah and Israel at various times actually became vassal states that were re required to pay tribute to other nations. 
and then eventually they became puppet states after after Jerusalem was attacked by Babylon, mm -hmm. uh, or Samaria became a puppet state to Assyria. And then eventually the people were carried away to all over the world, including Assyria and Babylon. And so this reporting of the facts is so selective. Like, does he not think that the Babylonian captivity should be taken into account if he's going to make a thesis about how nationalism and the existence of nations protects a nation from all these horrors? Like, that's a data point. Why are you allowed to just omit it? So Little John goes on, moreover, by replacing the rough justice of honor codes, blood avengers, and kinsmen redeemers with established courts of law, the nation promises greater stability and justice to its members. Now, is there anything in scripture that says that the institutions of blood avengers and kinsmen redeemers were replaced once the monarchy was established? Is there, what does he even mean? What is honor codes? I don't know what he's referring to. Does this man read the same book that I read? That's my question. <laughs> I, I mean, is it really the case that they had no courts of law or no system that was like a court of law before the monarchy? No, you're wrong, little John, because Boaz went to the, the elders in the city gate. That was their structure. So during the time of the monarchy, the members of the nation, did they really receive greater stability? Did they really receive greater assurances of justice, as little John says here? So from what I recall, many of the acts of injustice in these times were either perpetrated or led by the kings themselves. So again, I have to say, are we even reading the same book? He goes on, finally, by weakening the pressure of strict conformity that exists within the tribe, nations afford space for new ideas to develop and the pursuit of new forms of excellence. It's no coincidence that the reigns of David and Solomon were characterized by a flowering of music, architecture, and wisdom. Now, I find this argument startling, <laughs> like, like laughable. If monarchy accounts for a flourishing culture, why did it not happen during the reign of King Saul, but only under David and Solomon? Are there any yeah. other factors that could explain the flowering of culture under David and Solomon? Uh, okay, what about the immediate decline after Solomon? What accounts for that? So well, many it, facts left out. I'm curious, like, it, it, <laughs> is it, I mean, in addition to all of these foolish lines of uh, rationale that you're pointing out, Cody. I'm stepping back and trying to think of the big picture here. What what exactly is the point that he's trying to make? Like big picture, what is he trying to do with this article? And it, it seems like he's trying he's trying to make an argument for well, we don't want to have too small of collectives. We we don't want our collectives to be too small and balkanized because then there, there's all these inefficiencies and, and, and less room for cultural growth. Uh, so, but, but overall, the, the, the project of American reformer is to, to be anti-globalist and, and more pro-local. So it's almost like Little John was given the task of saying, all right, we need somebody to write an article to counterbalance the anti-globalist message that we're that we're promoting here with with a anti-balkanization uh message so that we get the right medium so that we get you know the right in between we're, we're we, we need we're fighting this extreme we need you little john to fight the other extreme so that we come to the right median like that, that that's that's the sense i get from this that's the only sense i can make of the point of this article you're right that's where he's going to go so it, it, it's just it's it's almost amusing. Like, like uh, uh, part of me thinks, did, did they actually explicitly have this conversation <laughs> when they were deciding that the topics and, and, and the goals of these articles, because the, it, 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 like, it almost seems like he's arguing counter to the rest of the authors. But well, when you think about the fact that these guys are pragmatists, that they are middle muddlers, that they are all about finding the median, the golden median on every issue, well, then that, that makes sense that, that they're basically just trying to say, let's avoid all the extremes. Let, let's, let's attack every extreme we can possibly uh, find so that we'll be as squarely in the middle as possible. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> He's going to discuss imperialism as sort of like there's this progress that, that you go from tribalism to nationalism to imperialism. And he says, that's too far. But this is this is just right. The Goldilocks solution right here. <laughs> yeah, let me let me go on. Uh, so now this is I think this reveals quite a bit. Uh, Little John says our word nation comes from the root as natal. 
the the nation is above all a community of shared birth. Although it may welcome strangers and immigrants willing to submit to its laws and like Ruth acknowledge its people as their own people, its God as theirs. So I have to ask, is Little John implying that in general nations today should have a religious test for immigration? Based on the previous article that we talked about, I think that's a strong possibility that that's what he advocates. Well, and hold on. What he 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 talks about common birth, but then he brings up Ruth and talks about common religion. Which is it? Well, because Ruth, although she did not have common birth, she was an exception. It's because he says it may welcome strangers and immigrants willing to acknowledge its God as theirs. Okay, so if so, but the primary is common birth. Yeah, that so, that gives you status immediately. So if if I'm born in Saudi Arabia, then I have to stick to the ideology of that geopolitical area of my natal of my birth, meaning Islam. And I and I ought to stay there. I ought not leave my homeland, according to the other article. And other people ought not come in unless they agree to the God, to the religion of that land, of the common birth of the people, meaning we should keep Christian missionaries out. I mean, this is just so, so, so stupid and so anti-Christian. I, how in the world can these guys think that this has anything to do with Christian thought or Christian sociology? I don't understand. So that seems to be the conclusion that he's arguing. But what's hilarious is that the Bible passage he uses to support it doesn't even support it. Like, does he actually think that an immigrant, this one story of one immigrant moving to Israel and converting to the Hebrew religion is enough to demonstrate his claim that other immigrants, or his implication, that other immigrants need to be converted as well before they are allowed to immigrate. I don't even know. Like, this is a historical question. I'd be interested to know. Like, could people move? I know that Romans moved, but that was under an um, oppressive nation. I don't know if, bef- if before, when Israel was its own nation, if people were allowed to move to Israel, even not being worshipers of God. But it, it, there's nothing to see in there that, that I remember in the Old Testament. I don't remember. D- does anything pop up to you? Uh, I, I'm not sure. But e- even if that wasn't the case with Israel, you still have to make an argument for why that ought to be the case with other nations, which are not composed as the people of God. Right. Right. (laughs) Because I mean, unless they want to be full on theonomists, which these guys don't want, these guys want to say, no, we're against theonomy. We're we're pro natural law. We don't think that you have to uh, cite a verse for every one of your political positions. Well, which is it then? So he goes on and claims Catholicism, Republicanism, Socialism, Capitalism, and Liberalism have each served as powerful and destructive imperial ideologies over the past few centuries. I think it's interesting that he, I mean, really, Republicanism led to imperialism? I'm not sure how. Capitalism led to imperialism? Classical liberalism led to imperialism? So that that's his claim. Um, And then he goes into this section where he's going to start critiquing empire building. He says, since the empire renounces any kind of commitment to shared birth as its foundation. I don't want to stop right there. That's his view. Nation should be defined by genealogy. Mm -hmm. We're getting the picture here. Um, So so I, I just want to assume for a second, if that is the overall outlook of the writers at American Reformer, this is going to help explain why they seemed callous this week toward the Afghans. So one of their founders this week, apparently, it's hard to tell because he blocked me and I didn't get a chance to flesh it out, but he apparently was downplaying the barbary that people are going to face under the Taliban. And and then there was another founder who was praising Biden's actions and praising his speech. But this is when Biden failed to fulfill his promises and abandoned tens of thousands of people, billions of dollars of American weapons to the Taliban. And he praised him because what matters is getting our people in our borders so uh, and we can make sure and link in the notes to some of these discussions that we've seen from uh, the first one was Nathaniel Fisher and the second sure. one was 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 Aaron Wren. Mm-hmm. But um, I want to continue with Little John's passage. He says, a national state finds itself surrounded by other national states with different customs, laws, cultures, and religions. 
because it has a strong sense of corporate identity, it has a thirst to excel them, and it seeks to learn from their strengths and avoid their failures. The nationalist order of early modern Europe proved the most powerful spur toward innovation and cultural development that the world has ever seen. Now, I think he's forgetting a lot of things here. First of all, there is no mention of Israel, no analysis of, of, of ancient Israel. Was ancient Israel benefited by its neighbors? Well, he's all of a sudden changed it to, to Europe because that's a much more favorable situation for his thesis. Uh, except for one thing. The Industrial Revolution centered first in Britain and the United States, and to some extent in France and Germany and the Netherlands. But Britain does not have neighbors surrounding it. And the United States of America had no influential neighbors surrounding it. So and, it's, it's, and the Industrial Revolution thrived much more in America than it did in European nation states. Much earlier, too. So... I'm, I'm just confused. Like, does, does he leave out the United States in the 18th, 18th century and in the 19th century? He just wants to talk about how France was benefited by being neighbors to Germany or Spain or something like that. Yeah, well, I, I think we've seen a, a trend with Little John in this entire article that he's extremely sloppily selective about the data points that he's going to focus on. And it, it's, it's, it's just obvious if you're going through here and you have any knowledge of scripture or any knowledge of history, you're left saying, well, wait, what about this? What about this? What about this? You completely left this out as if it, if it doesn't serve his thesis, then he just acts like it doesn't exist. It's ridiculous. Likewise, you could just look at the history of the United States, this one nation, and you could say, okay, so the United States started out as a republic and it has become more imperialistic over time. Do we see that the flowering of culture and of industry is, is like directly correlated with it, the United States being a republic at one point, and then something changes and suddenly once it's more of an empire, it's, it's less production of culture. Where's the correlation? You have to show the, the correlation or the concomitant variation um, or, or even the British empire. Like, okay, so some of the greatest, most important achievements of the, the British people took place while it was an empire, including its industrial revolution. This was all the, the achievement of the British empire. So, I, I'd like to ask him, does he think that it's not an example in his thesis here? Yeah, and, and note, we're not saying, therefore, empires are good, or that no. imperialism is good. We're, we're, we're not saying, because something happened to take place under a condition of imperialism, therefore, that's proof that imperialism is good. We're not that stupid. We're, we're not going to argue as sloppily as Little John is here. We're just bringing it up as a counterexample to his thesis and his rationale. And there are additional counterexamples, the Chaldean Empire, the Persian Empire. We don't consider those to be stagnant empires. But there we go. So on the surface, uh, for many, uh, for pretty much as many examples and I can, as I can imagine, the opposite of his thesis seems to be true. Uh, he doesn't offer a single example to clarify or explain his point, except he brings up the Tower of Babel. That's one example he tries to bring. And listen to how he conveniently, selectively redefines the situation as an attempt to stifle the emerging cultural diversity of the human race by building a great imperial city. So he's redefined all the key facts in order to fit a thesis. This is just a bad look. So finally, mercifully, he brings us to a conclusion. This is the last thing that I'll read from him. If nationalism names a commitment to the good of nations and to a political order of national states, it must remain an appropriately humble commitment rather than a dogmatic ideology. Even if we embrace nationalism in principle, it cannot tell us what the optimal size of a nation is or how much cultural or religious diversity the nation can tolerate without dissolving into chaos. All this must be learned from history and a careful attention to our contemporary situation. There's that Hegelian trial and error, ebb and flow, yes. thesis and antithesis uh, mindset of history of, well, that, that there's no dogmatic principles, even with this, even with this pragmatism that we want to embrace called yeah. nationalism. Don't be too well, principled about your pragmatism. Yeah, uh, we still want to be super pragmatic about that. And so we, we, we want to do the Hegelian thesis and antithesis. We want to do trial and error. We want to do uh, historical tests to see what works. How are we going to define what works? We're not going to answer that because we don't want to be too principled. We don't want to be too yes. ideological. Now, he, it's funny because somehow in his understanding, this idea of, of not coming down on a specific size of how big a country's borders or population should be, 
he says, ah, that's because we're rejecting dogmatic ideology. And that's kind of funny to me because like, I subscribe to an ideology, to a, to a system of thinking about political ideas in an integrated way. And m- my philosophy or political theory does not say how big the borders of the nation should be or how many people there should be in it. That's not a feature of an ideology. In fact, one of the features of an ideology is to say that's something that's outside of our our realm. You have to make that decision on other grounds other than ideological ones. There have to be. I mean, and so he's he's correct that we should learn from history. Obviously, who would disagree? We should pay careful attention to our situation. But the the fact that he positions that as a humble commitment to his principles rather than a dogmatic ideology is frustrating. And, you know, you can tell his meaning when he, he's saying, well, we don't know what the optimal size or cultural or religious diversity is that we can tolerate without dissolving into chaos. If you're going to make your decisions about whether you should stop new people from moving in or, or whether you should create an education system that indoctrinates people against these chaotic elements, if you're going to make those kinds of decisions, you're going to end up making them on the grounds of what you call humble commitments rather than ideology. It'll just be whatever you, you think is practical. I have a sense that our nation is in danger. I, I think that we have a consensus here among the leaders that we need to install some kind of new program to keep our country safe or, or to, to close the borders or whatever. It's going to be a pragmatic decision. That's how it's going to end up playing out. Yeah, It's, it's funny that he, he treats these sort of... Uh, non-essential and and in most contexts uh trivial issues like the the number of people in the nation it, it, apart from some emergency context that's trivial right the the amount of cultural or religious diversity in the nation apart from some emergency situation that's a trivial issue he the, the, he, he equates those with dogmatic ideology this is this is the same type of slippery move that people who are anti-theology make when they talk about, well, I don't want to argue about the color of the carpet. As if everybody who wants to argue about theology does just want to argue about the color of the carpet in the church. Right? It's, it's the same type of straw manning that goes on with theological controversies with those lazy people who are anti-theology. He's just anti-political ideology. He's anti-political doctrine. And so he's making the same type of sloppy uh, characterization of well, I- ideology, dog- dogmatism in this area—that's all about the color of the carpet. That's all about: are we going to have nine hundred ninety-nine thousand people, or are we going to have nine hundred ninety thousand and one people? Right? It, that's, that's all insignificant. There's a common point between what these national conservatives do when they approach principles, and also what political moderates like David Brooks at the New York Times does or between even what fascists, like actual historical identifiable fascists do. Um, And the approach is a hodgepodge of whatever political principles that you decide that you think is needed at the time. Uh, What's your standard? Uh, Common sense. Whose common sense? Mine. So we also know that Little John has argued in defense of Timothy Keller's collectivist view of justice. So while Little John would probably criticize Keller and say, you know, you really don't need to be defending Democrats so often. On the philosophical fundamentals that we described in our videos and articles on Timothy Keller, such as his pathological altruism, his twisted collectivistic view of justice that logically follows from that, uh, that would actually destroy the gospel if you took it seriously, Timothy Keller and Brad Little John do agree. Collectivists are gonna collectivize. That's just the way it is. They're gonna collectivize your approach to knowledge your approach to value, your approach to rights and political organization, they're going to find reasons to collectivize and to make excuses for it. So it's no surprise that somebody like that has written for the faux Christian organization that calls itself mere orthodoxy, which regularly advocates for Christian socialism in a movement that calls itself national conservatism, Christian socialism is exactly what you're going to get So that's as far as our tour of the American Reformer website will take us. And I just want to give you my conclusion of this project. It's going to be a continual disaster. And that's the same thing I think about the broader movement that calls itself national conservatism. It's just going to be a disaster. But there is a silver lining. The silver lining is that there is at least this. 
we have a list of these writers who think this way and who are willing to identify with each other. <laughs> so they've done us a favor of gathering in one place and, and it's actually easier to understand what one or the other may be thinking when you understand that they associate with each other. It's, it makes it easier because you know a lot of the writing is vague, unconcretized. But if you take note of who they tolerate and who they praise, that will show you the positions that this group holds. One Q&A question came in from a friend and he said, okay, so why are there so many thinkers and writers who are concerned about supporting the institution of the family, but also seem so quick to abandon individual rights? Is there a different anthropology at play here? Jacob, do you have a quick answer on that? Yeah, in some ways that, that's absolutely the case. It's a different anthropology. It's a collectivized anthropology. It's basically, here's, here's what they do. The, the conservatives, by and large, are repulsed by the widespread globalistic collectivism and altruism even of the left because they see that it's ultimately nihilistic. It's ultimately destructive. And so they have a knee-jerk reaction to rebel against that. And, and so they, they want to assert something. They, they want to assert positive personal values, which is good. We, we, we agree with that. They, they, they want to assert some form of rational self-interest. But they can't go far enough so as to do that for the individual because they still have fundamental convictions about the evil of individualism and about the evil of rational self-interest. So they take a middle ground between rational individualism and collectivism. And that middle ground is the family. So th th their, their rebellion against the left can only go so far as protecting the family. Th th they want to assert something positive that they can say, I'm called to protect this. But because they can't go to the individual, they go to the family. They will say, I will protect my family because God has given me the responsibility to protect my family, my, mine family. And, and they'll even say, I don't care about your family if it's going to be a threat to my family. At least some of them might say that. They will especially say that if your family is across the globe or across the border. But the closer that gets to the self, the more hesitant they are to say with conviction, to hell with you, so long as you are a threat to me and what's mine, right? So it's sort of concentric circles. The, the leftists want to expand that circle of what you're going to treat as no further, this is mine, I have a right to protect it. They want to expand that to everybody, to the globe. And the conservative is going to say, no, I hate that. That's bad, that, that's, that's destructive. But then they're, they're going to be selective upon various degrees on where they're going to draw that line. Some of them are going to draw it at the nation state and say, all right, I'll, I'll, I'll sacrifice even my family for the sake of other people within my own nation state, within my own racial ethnic group. But, I, but not, I draw the line at anybody outside of that, right? Or they'll say, well, no, I, I'm not going to sacrifice my family for the sake of somebody in a different state. Like, I'm at, we're in Texas, they're in, I don't know, New York. I, well, th they might as well be a different people. But I will sacrifice my family for the sake of those in my local community. So it's a smaller circle. And then some will even go so far as, I, I will not sacrifice my family to some other family outside of my, uh, in my community, outside of my biological family, but I'm, I, I might sacrifice my family to other people in my same blood lineage, right? I, I might sacrifice the good of my wife and my kids for the sake of those who are our cousins, our distant cousins or something like that, right? They, they, they can't come to the point of saying, no, even if my wife turns against me and becomes an enemy of Christ and an enemy of me, I'm not going to sacrifice myself. I've seen this. So I saw somebody post, and you might've shared this with me. Somebody said that if their family member had done something illegal, that you would cover it up 
because that's what true loyalty means something yeah. like that yeah that, that was that was true brotherly love something like that it, it was uh it was a prominent conservative on twitter i can't remember his name right now if i saw i i want to say jesse kelly maybe i i might i might have that wrong um if i if i saw him i i'll, I'll recognize him i'll let you know uh but yeah he, he was talking about uh andrew cuomo uh and chris cuomo about chris cuomo covering for andrew cuomo uh and him basically slaughtering all the old people in the nursing homes. And I, I was, or somebody was criticizing Chris Cuomo for being dishonest like that. And this guy was saying, well, no, he, uh, I would do the same thing for my brother. That, that's, that's brotherly love. That's, that's family. Family comes above morality. Family comes above principles. That's really the sad thing is that, uh, and, and see from our outlook, the allegiance to principles is actually more valuable than the allegiance to your own family. I mean, what else was Jesus saying when he says that you have to hate your your brother and your father and your mother uh, be willing to follow me? He's saying that there is a, a structure here of the, what is more important and what's not as important. And the opposite of what we advocate is this tribalist mentality. It's my pack. And so therefore we have to cover for them right or wrong. Yeah, and, my, and, my country right or wrong. And let me qualify because again, there's going to be a straw man. We don't believe that what Jesus was teaching there was your obligation is to hate your mother and father. Not at all. Like, period. Right. That, that's not what Jesus was teaching, and, and we don't affirm that. He, what he was teaching, and what we would affirm is you need to be prepared to hate your mother and father to the extent that your mother and father hate Jesus. To the extent that your mother and father hate what is good and true and beautiful and holy, you need to be prepared to hate them for the sake of what is good, true, beautiful, and holy, right? Yep. That, that is the individualism that we're advocating. Not hate everybody, including your mother and father, for the sake of hating them arbitrarily. No. Be prepared to hate them to the extent that they hate what is good and true and beautiful and holy. Your allegiance must be ultimately to what is objectively true and good. Okay, I wanna offer my answer to that same question. It was, why are so many thinkers and writers who are concerned about supporting the institution of the family also so quick to abandon individual rights? And I mean, you can see on the basis of what Jacob just explained, well, individual rights are a principle that must be held by the individual. The, the, a principle is something that, that each person has to decide that they will elevate and that they will cherish and if you're not willing to take an individualistic view on values as such, well, then if you're ever faced with, I must hold my principle or I must be loyal to my family, you're going to choose the family because the family is a collective and there's safety in that collective. Now, it's natural, as, as Jacob was explaining, to have more love for your family than for your neighbors. And it's natural to have more love for your neighbors and friends than for your entire nation because it's an abstraction. That, that's fine. But the, the trouble, from my point of view, uh, the way I'd answer that question is that they've, they've realized that the value has to be related to you personally, but they haven't been willing to do the final step of the analysis. And that is to say that all values to me are values to me. And like, like Rand says, to say I love you, you must first know how to say the I. You have to love your own life and see your values in relation to your own life. And if you're willing to do that, then you'll be willing to take personal responsibility for all these principles, including, uh, you know, the, the idea of rational egoism. You'll be you'll be open to that. You'll be open to individual rights because you, you treat everybody else as having that same status as being willing to be a rational egoist. You respect that in them. Here, here's here are my thoughts. Placing the definition of value within a collective that is very small and, and natural like a family. It has the effect of shielding these family values socialists from having to think about their philosophical principles in an integrated way. So they will reject ethical egoism. They will reject its corollary in epistemology, the self-directed, self-responsible search for truth. It's because if, if you make the family your standard of value, then you just go with the flow and with your family. And going with the flow is very easy and natural when you're with your family. And it's apparently even a fruitful practice to just be the kind of person who goes with the flow. Uh, but you, if you place the group as your standard of value, then you are no longer taking responsibility for defining your values. They come to you ready-made, or at least that's what it seems. And so I want to point out that what's going on here is it's almost like 
the responsibility to identify your own values has been subsidized. Yep. And that, that's yeah. the collectivist attitude. And that's what's so ironic about so many of these guys being part of the new masculinity movement is, you know, and, and they rightly identify self-responsibility and, and uh, self-reliance and, or personal responsibility uh, as uh, essential to masculinity. But then they abdicate that when it comes to spiritual things like your beliefs and your values. It, it, and again, I think this goes back to, uh, like the question was asking, a different anthropology. They, they don't see man as a being with a mind. They see man fundamentally more naturalistically as a, a physical being more, more like an ant or an insect or an animal that's part of a pack than they do as a being with a mind. Because if man has a mind, then you've got personal responsibility, not just over your body and, and you're know, working out and being healthy, that they're all for that. But you also have personal responsibility over what you're going to believe, what you're going to value. And that means that you can't farm that out to your family, just like you can't farm out your physical well-being to your family by living in your mom's basement into your 30s and 40s. So also you can't farm out your intellectual well-being and your moral well-being, the well-being of your character and your person to your family by functionally living in the basement of your family's moral code into your 30s and 40s. You have to grow up in the life of your mind. You have to grow up in the life of your character, in your spirit, and take personal responsibility for your beliefs and your values. It's scary, I know, but just like with your physical well-being and going out on your own and getting a job and being able to take care of yourself materially, you need to be able to do the same thing spiritually and ideologically. You need to learn how to be your own man in the life of your mind and in the life of your values. You need to learn how to build your own character. That's what it means to be a man. Those people that make my family the standard of value i think for them it's a fairly easy jump from like this little collective is a standard of value to the bigger collective is is the standard of value as well to mm -hmm. to a lesser degree and the bigger wider it is the lesser degree it's diluted but it's still the standard and then they can have no allegiance to this principle of individual rights like the question was asking and so from there it's a very small step to say oh well the the broader collective should subsidize my family and then you yeah. have the welfare state the approach that you have today that this this is a collectivization and a subsidizing of, of values. And I think that's one of the common themes. And I want I want to paint a picture of that. You elevate the family as the standard of value. You think you're justified in subsidizing the family. And in the end, it is really it's just subsidies that I think collectivists are after something for nothing. That's what they are after. Uh, and so let me, let me explain the pattern as pertains to knowledge. They want knowledge without personal responsibility. They want something for nothing. They want second-handed subsidized thinking. As pertains to values, they don't want it to be directly tied to your own personal interest. They cannot have that because then you'd have responsibility. But they want values without that responsibility. Value is going to require, on their view, that someone else makes a sacrifice. Otherwise, it's not, we're not talking about values unless somebody has sacrificed something. Mm -hmm. uh, so all values, in their view, are subsidized values. And then finally, as pertains to the social organization, they see a, an organization of society with no individual rights. Your family lives off the subsidies owed to you by the state. That is the logical conclusion. It should be no surprise that so many people follow that path. One thing to note is that that mindset, it, it justifies the socialistic collectivism that we're talking about, but it also justifies the hedging the bets. Uh, the, the moderation that conservatives want to have because there's that diluting factor, right? So it, it, it's a standard of value as it expands, but, but less and less so the more it expands. And so whenever that system falls apart, which it inevitably does because socialism always does, they've got a, a backup plan or, or a way to blame, uh, to point blame that, deflects it from their standard of value it's not that they were too collectivist it was that they just they didn't get the gradation right they didn't get the degrees right right that, that, that's what they're going to say because that, that these 
family friendly and socialists are going to say, well, yes, the, the collective is a standard of value. The family is a standard of value. And it's just a, a pragmatic uh, judgment call as far as determining to what extent do we treat the collective as a standard of value as it goes out. And so if the system collapses, they're going to say, oh, well, we, we just got it wrong. We just have to try it again with tweaking it a little bit here and there. We didn't dilute it the right way. We didn't do it to the right degree here. And, and so we just got to tweak it some more. And so it's going to be the same thing as a socialist on the left who always say, well, that wasn't true socialism. These guys are going to say, well, that, that, that they're not really going to say it wasn't true socialism. They probably won't ever call it socialism. But they are going to say, well, we just didn't get it right. We just didn't fine tune it enough. We just weren't pragmatic enough with it. We just got to try again. Trial and error. We need to put the right people in charge next time. That's right. We need to just hire experts next time. Yeah. That'll be the solution. Now, if you're looking for a principled approach, do not seek the thoughts of the American reformer. Uh, FTNCI is one of a group of organizations that is devoted to the objectivity of truth. Find someone who is teaching the objectivity of truth, the black and white nature of individual rights. Learn the case and then become an advocate of yourself. If you'd like to help us with our getting our message out, you can support us on Patreon, of course, and you can you can consider making extra donations even. We use that in order to buy back our time so that we can devote more time to the level of research that we did in these videos. We will ask you also, do what you can to speak to the people that you know that will listen, to get these ideas in front of as many people as possible. Uh, that is the, the actual masculine approach. Thank you for listening to our video today. God bless. Amen.